Well, good evening again. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I am thankful to see you back tonight. I'm thankful to worship with you and to have one more opportunity to open the Word of God with you all. I'm thankful. Raise your hands if you were here yesterday for the conference yesterday. Oh, yeah, the Sunday night crowd would, of course, have been at the conference on Saturday. Uh, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, that's okay. There's, there's forgiveness in, in the gospel. Uh, there's reconciliation in heaven. It's all right. Uh, if your Bibles are open to Hebrews 11, you can leave them there. Um, we're going to be all over the Bible tonight. We're going to be all over the Old Testament. But before we start, I want to pray one more time. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just thankful for you guys and for your church and for you, your hosp hospitality towards me and um, letting me share the word of God with you. I love, I love preaching. And... Uh, because I love the word of God, and I hope you love it, and I hope it ministers to your heart as well. I mean, it should just strike you that, like, the world is going by out there. They're driving by, and they're going around the roundabout, and going around it again, and a third time, and they're going doing things. And uh, you're not. You know, you pulled over, you came in the parking lot, you're singing songs, you're praying to a God who hears, and now you're hearing from his word. And this is, more, this is more meaningful than anything else out there. And so I'm just thankful that you're here to dive into the word of God. So, Lord, we pray uh, in light of your goodness and your kindness towards us, we pray that your word would minister to us tonight. We don't pray presumptively. We know your spirit moves where he wants to move, and he does what he wants to do. And so we pray really in light of the fact that your spirit has already provoked us to come before you. And so we pray tonight that as we look into your word, we would identify with you and with your people over and against the world. So help us do that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk tonight about the nature of living a life that's not in conformity to this world. I remain persuaded that probably the biggest challenge to Christian living and specifically Christian parenting is to embrace the idea that our identity is not found in this world. I think the desire to make this world our home is the root of so much that is wrong in the church today. It leads to so many kind of problems. You know, we have often as Christians, we lose the foundational reality that our identity is that of strangers and pilgrims and aliens rather than as residents here. You know, this world is not our home. It shouldn't be our home. We're passing through. This room is at best, this world is at best a hotel room. And like not a nice hotel room. Like one of the like Airbnbs that's like, you know, shady, like two stars Airbnb. You check in and the cockroaches check out. You know those kind of places to stay. That's what this world is like. You know, you have never stayed in a hotel room and like done housework there. You don't fix things that are broken. The, the light bulb is broken, you call somebody else. You don't fix it. You know, there's a crack in the wall. You don't plaster it. Something's wrong with the bathroom sink. You don't fix it in a hotel room because you're only there one night, and then you move on with your life. So I just, I fear that so often people view this world not as a hotel room, but as their home, and they, you know, they're doing housework on it and such. They're painting the walls. They're moving in. They want to be comfortable there. And we're prone to thinking too much about this world, too much to try to fit into this world, too much to get the government to accept us or the world to accept us or the culture to accept us. You know, honestly, the more the government leaves us alone, the better. Amen? That's right. We say we love Jesus, we say we want to go to heaven, but too often we take our time and our effort to build cathedrals here rather than working on sending our treasure ahead to the next world. So what's the root of our infatuation with this world? I think often it's misplaced faith. Faith becomes mental assent. We say, hey, we, we believe the Bible is true. It's knowledge that we believe. We're here, right? But when you start viewing like that, the, the edges of the Bible have kind of been dulled. Aquinas divined 
to find faith is an act of the intellect when it assents to divine truth under the influence of the will moved by the Holy Spirit through grace. That's a great definition of faith. Yeah, it's mental assent that the Bible is true. When the Holy Spirit moves you by his will, and when that happens to you, it changes your heart and it changes your affections and it changes your identity. The notion of faith in the Bible is firmly setting your confidence on something else other than this world. When you're living for this world, that's not faith. I mean, that's what everybody, that you're living in, you can stand on this world. My feet are on it, so you're living for it. That doesn't require faith. It's where you are. When you're living for the next world and when you're identifying for the next world that you can't see, you can't taste, you can't touch, you can't handle, that's faith. Setting your faith firmly on something you can't see. The Anchor Bible Dictionary, which is a very good Bible dictionary, describes faith this way. It says, faith in the Bible isn't defined, but it is described. I, I just like that definition. I like it when a dictionary cheats like that. This word can't be defined. You're the dictionary. But the Bible does describe faith, it says. We read Hebrews 11 for the scripture reading, and as you read it, all kinds of things jump out in Hebrews 11. There's the idea of wanting to be rewarded by God. That's in there. You know, all those people we read about had this idea that God would reward them when they die. Even uh, Paul at the end says that these people all died in faith, not having received what was promised them. I mean, the idea is their faith is future, looking to a future world. So that's going on all over Hebrews 11. But there's something else that struck me in the last year. I think largely through, through COVID and COVID restrictions is one of the things that my mind got wrapped up the most around is a different element in Hebrews 11, something I had, I think I had overlooked through much of my Christian life. Do you notice that every person in that part of Hebrews 11 that you read, every one of those people identifies with God and God's people over and against the elements of this world? Like it's an identity thing. It's a, it's a belief thing. They believe that God exists and that God will reward those who seek them. But then when you get into the actual people, it is a fight to identify with God and God's people over and against the people of this world. It's a countercultural faith. So I want to give you a bit of a survey of four of those people tonight. I've got four different little stories of faith. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12 first. So leave Hebrews 11, Genesis 12. We're going to go through these four different little stories of faith in the order there in the Bible. So we're always going to be moving left to right. Genesis 12 is kind of the first picture, the first explicit picture of saving faith in the Bible. I mean, I believe Adam probably had saving faith, but he also had an advantage. He was walking with God before the fall and such. Noah had faith. You know, of course, he built the ark and endured the ridicule of the world. But, you know, when Paul talks about saving faith, he goes back to Abraham. We as Christians are just considered children of Abraham because we have Abraham's faith rather than children's of no, children of Noah. And I think it's worth starting in Genesis chapter 12. And I just want you to just, in a new way, as we read Genesis 12, I want you to picture and understand how so much of Abraham's faith is willing to identify with God in contrast to identifying even with his own family. Genesis 10, Genesis 11, it's a list of the begats, their family trees, who had who and who had who and all the, everybody is connected to something. Genesis 10 and 11 is connecting everybody to somebody before them. It's a long list of family trees thrown in with the Tower of Babel. So the days of Peleg, Genesis 10, the nations divide. Genesis 11, the languages divide. So people are all, are all connected to their family. Their lands are divided. Their languages are divided. But they are inside of their land and inside of their nation connected to each other. So everybody has family. Everybody has land. That's what's going on in this part of the Bible. And then Genesis 12 comes. 12 verse 1, Yahweh said to Abram, go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, and to the land I will show you. So what's noteworthy here is these people are leaving all the things that in Genesis 10 and 11 that give you your identity. I mean, you are 
what your name is, you are who your family is, you are where you work, you are where you live. In this world, they're farmers. The, you know, their land is who they are. Genesis 10 and 11, the, this family had this land. That's who these people are. And here in Genesis 12, it's the opposite of everything else that has gone before this. You know, Adam and Eve, they had to leave their land, but that's because sin entered the world and they got evicted. But after that, people don't leave their land. But this is what God calls Abraham to do, to leave his father's house, which means leave his family, to leave his father's land, his country, his, his kindred. Nobody did that back then. You didn't go and just wander the world to find yourself. I mean, they were not millennials, you know. <laughs> Nobody left their land or their family for any reason whatsoever. But this is what Abram is supposed to do. The way the entire world worked was your family and your land gave you your identity, and God calls Abraham to leave it, and that's ridiculous. Nobody does that. He's 75 years old, by the way. This is not a midlife crisis. He's seven, this is too old to start over. And he left it all. God tells him, I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing, verse 3, I'll bless those who bless you. To him who dishonors you, I'll curse them. All the families of the earth will be blessed. This is a global promise in God. The promise that is given to Abraham will be those that, you know, come from him and have their faith in his offspring will be blessed. Everybody else in the world will be cursed. So there is the identity divide. Are you going to side with the promise to Abraham and his descendants or everybody else in the world? That's the divide. And so Abram went. As Yahweh told him, verse 4, said, and Lot went with him. And that was its own punishment, being stuck with Lot. He was 75 years old. He took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, all their possessions, all they gathered, people they acquired in Haran. They set out to go to the land of Canaan. And they went to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I'll give you this land. He built an altar there. An altar to Yahweh. Look at verse 10. There was a famine in the land. So he had to even leave that. He went down to Egypt to sojourn there. This is faith. I, I just want you to appreciate Abram's faith just in this passage. We know how the story ends. You know, this is the Sunday night crowd. So you know, what, you know who Abraham is. You know how you know how this thing turns out, right? <laughs> but for a moment, just appreciate what Abram did. This is the moment that Paul references in the New Testament when he said Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This was that moment right here. The challenge for Abram was to side with God's promise over and against his family, his identity, his job, his nation, his people, everything. It's not reasonable. He's too old. But he loses everything. And it doesn't work out for him so far. He's stuck in famine. He, he shops his wife out to Pharaoh. Twice. This doesn't go well for him. Even when he dies, he never, he never gets to have his people established in the promised land. There's famine. He bounces to Egypt. He's going to wander away back. He doesn't get to make this his home. And yet he believes God over and against what everybody else in the world would have done, which was side with their family. That's the nature of his faith. Yes, he just intellectually believed that what God said was true. He also believed that God would reward him if he sought him. But that involved an identity shift where he went from identifying with this world to identifying with God and God's people. It's insane. Nobody else did that. But Abram did. That's the first example. Abram identifying with God over and against even his family. Second example, Moses. Turn over to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. This is before the plagues. This is before the Lord has appeared to Moses. This is critical to understand when you read about Moses' faith. Moses' faith is seen before Yahweh appears to him, really. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household. We read that in Hebrews 11 earlier. He's the prince of Egypt title of the Disney cartoon, so you know it's true. He was on his way 
to political power, if not to be the pharaoh himself, at least to a life of immense privilege, immense power, immense luxury. He had it all before him. He was educated. He was erudite. He had a life in Pharaoh's house, a life of royalty, luxury, and privilege. That's what he had. You know, historians say that this generation in Egypt was one of the most refined and literate in Egypt's entire history. Sometimes you picture people in the ancient Near East as backwards and like banging stones together. That was not these Egyptians. They had a culture of literature, a culture of, of art. They were educated, sophisticated, erudite. Acts 7, verse 22, in Stephen's speech, when Stephen references Moses, he says that Moses had all the wisdom of Egypt at his disposal. In other words, he had the best education. In Acts 11, I mean, in uh, Hebrews 11, Paul says he has all the riches of Egypt. And in Acts 7, Stephen says he has all the education of Egypt. This, he, Moses is in a privileged, powerful, wealthy, educated position. A life of privilege. But Moses knew his roots. That comes out in the story. Moses, remember, was put in the, the water. He floated away. He knows he's Jewish. He was raised by his mom, even in Pharaoh's household. He knows who he really is. Of course, he knows of God's promise to Abram. Moses probably doesn't know much about Yahweh. He doesn't know the name Yahweh yet, for example. He doesn't, he doesn't know a lot about Yahweh. But what Moses knows is that God promised to Abram to put Abram's offspring back in the promised land. Moses is aware of that. Well, look at verse 11 of Exodus chapter 2. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out, look at the language here, he went out to his people. He looked on their burdens. They're his people, but they're not his burdens. You see that? These are his people. They're not his burdens. His people have burdens. Moses doesn't. Moses is wealthy and powerful and privileged. Then he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. The language, like one day when Moses went out, it implies that this was a custom Moses did. Moses would go out there and watch the Israelites work. And it's just picture the emotional turmoil that's going on inside of them. He knows they're his people. They're not his burdens. He has a different privilege and a different education, but he is torn. I mean, what is the prince of Egypt doing walking around the Israelite slaves building the temples? I mean, what, what is he doing out there? Much less, what is he doing going out there all the time? The Hebrew verb tense here for one day when Moses went out, it's this progressive tense. In other words, this was Moses' habit of going out there and watching the Israelites work. What do you think is going through his head? I mean, this man is a wreck. He's trying to figure out where he belongs. You know, he watches his people suffer, and then he goes back into Pharaoh's house for Pharaoh's food and Pharaoh's books and Pharaoh's slaves and every, all the privileges. And then next week, he goes back out and just watches the slaves work again. The guy is in turmoil. And then one day he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Again, notice the phrase again at the end of verse 11. One of his people. Moses is fully aware who he is. Verse 12. He looked this way and that. That's kind of a cool translation there. Moses, his eyes dodge this way. His eyes dodge that way. He looks every which way trying to figure out if he can get away. I picture like the cartoon animal with like the thin eyes. Like, can he do it? And he does it. He sees no one watching him. He strikes the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. That's kind of an ironic turn of events here. Verse 13, he went out next day, and behold, two Hebrews are struggling together. He said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? I mean, that's a very profound question, too. Who made him prince? So he's the prince of Egypt. And the guy says, who, are you the, who made you the prince? Why are you trying to judge the Israelites? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. Moses panics. Why do you think he panicked? You know, this is the ancient Near East. Moses killed an Egyptian for beating up a Hebrew slave. Moses is in the Pharaoh's household. Moses could get away with this. This would not be a difficult crime to cover up. This is not, I mean... Princes kill slaves all the time in this part of the world. This would not be unusual. What is interesting here is the 
identity of these people here. Moses is concerned he's going to be outed as an Israelite. Moses is, going to, is concerned he's going to be viewed as a traitor to Egypt. That's the problem here. The problem isn't that a prince killed the slave. The problem is that this prince doesn't know what side he's on. He's hemming and hawing. Pharaoh's going to hear about Moses' identity crisis here, and he's going to seek to kill Moses. He can't have a rebellion inside of his house. Moses flees from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. Moses gets out of town. And this is the, where Moses goes to be a shepherd. Moses doesn't know how the story ends. He runs off to the wilderness. So he goes from being prince in Egypt to a homeless guy wandering around in the wilderness overnight. Why did he make that change? Because he was torn over his identity for so long, going back and forth, and he finally decides he would rather identify with God's people than he would have all the privileges of Pharaoh's house. It is, again, an identity decision he makes. He wants to be on God's side and on the side of God's people. And that, by the way, is also ironic when you know Moses' story. Did God's people ever like Moses? Did they ever return the favor? Moses lost everything to help the Israelites out, and the Israelites hated Moses until his dying day. He leads them out of Egypt, and they are just like a thorn in his side. And this starts here, remember? They, Moses murders the guy to help defend an Israelite, and the next day they're like, who are you? Why don't you go back to Pharaoh's house? So Moses has no excuse. He knows the Israelites are never, ever, ever going to respect him. And the whole life, his whole life goes just like this. He does something great for them. He helps them, and they rebel against him. That's the story of Moses' life. So much so, when Moses comes down the mountain, he finds them worshiping idols. He finds them fully rebelling. This is all in the future. And God says, all right, I'm going to smoke them all. And Moses says, then smoke me too. I'm, gonna, I'm going down with my people then. Moses is firmly on the side of God's people. He doesn't want to be identified with the Egyptians. He doesn't want to be identified with wealth. He doesn't want to be identified with education. He wants to be identified with God's people, even if it costs him everything. He leaves his life of luxury and privilege to go wander around the wilderness, yet be identified with God's people. This is the moment of his faith. This is before the burning bush. This is before, this is before the, the ten plagues. At this moment, Moses is all in with God and God's people. This is the moment Hebrews 11 says it identifies as Moses' faith. It's not crossing the, the Red Sea. It's this moment right here. And Moses is not commended for being a murderer. The Hebrew says, doesn't say, oh, Moses had faith because he murdered a dude. Hebrew says Moses had faith because he identified with God's people rather than with the riches of Egypt. So that's the war. Abraham identified with God's people and God's promise over his own family. Moses identifies with God's people and God's promise over his own wealth and over his own privilege. He's valuing the life of an outlaw over the life of a scholar. This is a, a hundred years after Joseph. And then he says, I'm going to identify with God's people. I'd rather suffer in the wilderness and have the comforts of home if suffering in the wilderness lets me, with a clean conscience, say I'm on the side of God and God's people. He has confidence and faith, and he comforts. He has more confidence in his faith than all the value of human comforts. Fear of God was more significant to him than fear of Pharaoh. He'll run away from Pharaoh. He can't run away from God. So Abram identifies with God over his family. Moses identifies with God over education and wealth and power. Third example, Rahab. Turn over to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Rahab, every time she is introduced, she's introduced as the prostitute Rahab. You see her in the New Testament a few times. James, Hebrews, both places introduce her as the prostitute. Why? I mean, she's not perpetually a prostitute. Why is she identified as a prostitute? It's a little bit of condemning Israel. Israel's a prostitute. Some pagan prostitute is going to demonstrate more faith in God and God's promises than all the Israelites, all the self-righteous Torah-keeping Israelites throughout their history. Rahab has more faith than all of them. Let's look at Rahab's faith. Joshua chapter 2. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly 
as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Notice that Joshua has learned lessons from Moses. Moses didn't send the spies secretly, remember? Moses sent 12 spies and wanted like a public report. And <laughs> what followed was 40 years in the wilderness wandering and everybody died, including Moses. So that was the result of that strategic error. Joshua is like, I haven't learned a lot from Moses, but I learned this. Don't send 12 spies and have them give a public report. So Joshua sends two, and they're to be secret. They're going to come back and report only to Joshua, it says. Go look at verse 1, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they're going to come back and report only to Joshua. Jericho, I don't know if you've been to Israel or to Jericho. There's the Jordan River. There's wilderness where the Israelites are. Jordan River, then like five miles, which in kilometers is like, I don't know, a million kilometers. I don't know how it translates. Eight and a half kilometers. Something like that. From the Jordan River to Jericho. And there's nothing there. Nothing. Like the biggest bush is the size of this pulpit, which is a massive pulpit, but not big enough to hide a person. There's not really trees out there. There might be a few trees along the river. And it's just a vast expanse. Behind Jericho is the hills that go up to, towards Jerusalem. You cannot sneak up on Jericho. There's no sneaking up on Jericho. If you're crossing the river, it's like everybody can see you for a long ways before you get to the city. These two spies have to sneak up on Jericho. So they're not going with, you know, dressing like a bush. <laughs> they're going to walk up to the city. But what are they going to do when they walk up to the city? So you need some kind of cover here. What would two travelers who aren't known in the city who are coming from the wilderness, everybody's going to see that they cross the Jordan, you know, the outlook is going to, the, the spy, the guards, the sentries, they're going to see these guys coming. What would be a good excuse for two guys coming from the wilderness into a city they don't normally come to? So, and to make the plan even more effective, they're going to have to go to a place, uh, somebody that will take them in, preferably somebody by the, the gate of the city that has a good look on, on people. And also if this person valued discretion, that would also be good. So think through the list of, of what they're looking for. They need a cover story for entering the city by the gates with a person who values discretion and is not going to talk. And what you find is a prostitute that checks all of those boxes. That's a plausible excuse for coming to the city. Hey, we've journeyed far. We're coming to the prostitute's house. Prostitute's not going to tell people what's going on. She's, I mean, she's going to stay quiet. That's kind of part of her, her job here. And they're positioned at the city gate. They know everybody. So this is not like... This is why the New Testament keeps referring back to her as a prostitute also, by the way. It is kind of a key element of the story. I just don't want it get, to get airbrushed out of the way. So these two walk into the city. They go to the prostitute's house. The prostitute was named Rahab. They go and they lodge there. They spent the night there. And the king of Jericho finds out. Now, you think you know this story, don't you? Everybody knows the story of Rahab. But I'm surprised when you read this story carefully... The chronology of the story is very different than I had remembered it. I remembered the, the Vases events in a totally different order. The VeggieTales version of the story gets it totally wrong. If you watch the VeggieTales version. Don't get theology from VeggieTales. It was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, the men of Israel came here tonight to search out the land. So the king of Jericho sends to Rahab and saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house. For they have to come to search out all the land. So the king doesn't fall for this. The king's not falling for the whole they came to a prostitute ruse. He's not buying it. However, verse 4, the woman, Rahab, had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. At this point, Rahab has not, she doesn't have a deal with these people. She hasn't negotiated anything with them. She's summoned to the king. She hides her two customers and runs to the king and then is telling the king the total lie before she's even told, told this to the people. Oh, they've run, they've run to the river really fast. Go see if you can catch them. But she had brought them, verse 6, to the roof and hid them with Stacks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. 
So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. So it's kind of a funny little scene here. The prostitute's like, they went, the, they went that way. Hurry! It was only a few minutes ago. If you run and you send everybody, you might catch them. And so you picture all like the horsemen scrambling and the fighter jets scrambling and everybody, you know, the police station clear out. And, and something happens in Australia that does not happen in the United States. In the United States, when somebody calls for the police, they don't come from the police station. They're already out. But the library I'm studying in overlooks a police station right now in Burwood. And so I see it happening. Like, a, apparently somebody called for help, and I'll see, the, like, the police officers jogging or sometimes walking with their coffee out of the, the police station. There, All the cars are parked in. They'll get in, like, four cars, and they all take off with their lights and sirens on. It's kind of fun to watch. I don't know where they're going. I make up stories about it in my own mind. But that's what, that's what Rahab did. She's like, they ran to the river fast, send everybody. And so, you know, everybody comes trotting out of the police office, gets in the cars, and drives away. It's a total lie. And they fall for it. The men pursued after them all the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords and the river. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Well, before the men lay down, Rahab comes back to them on the roof. And this is where you see your faith. I know Yahweh's given you in the land. Fear of you has fallen upon us. All the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We've heard what happened to everybody. We've heard about this. You know, understand, the king's order to Rahab was a lawful order, wasn't it? He's the king of the city. He's in charge. He's the highest government official, and there are enemies in the city who are going to attack the city. So that's, we all know that. The king knows that. The reader knows that. The spies know that. Rahab knows that. Everybody has those basic facts down. The king is in charge. These guys are there to harm the city, and they're in the city. And so the king is well within his rights to tell the prostitutes, give those guys up because they're a threat to us. This is a, the picture of a lawful command. And Rahab lies. Rahab refuses to comply. Why? And it's not because she was promised safety. This is before she's negotiated any kind of scarlet thread, before any of that. These spies don't know what she's up to. But at this moment, Rahab has decided... Like Moses, Moses had a choice to make. Am I going to be identified with the Israelites even though they reject me? Or with the Egyptians? Abram, am I going to identify with God's promise or with my family? And here's Rahab. Am I going to identify with God's people more than my own government, more than my own leaders, more than my own country, more than my own life? She's going to lose everything. She would rather identify with God and God's people even though it could cost her everything. This is her faith. You know, I, sometimes people are saying, get stuck in that Rahab, who Rahab lied, is lying okay under certain circumstances. Rahab is not commended for lying any more than Moses was commended for murdering. Moses' faith expressed itself in murdering the dude, which was not a smart thing to do. Rahab's faith expressed itself here in lying. Certainly there could have been ways out of this that don't involve lying. The point is not about the lying or about the murder. Don't get sidetracked on when you can murder an Egyptian. Don't get sidetracked on when you can lie to a king. The point in both stories is that these people decided I'd rather be identified with God's people over my own power, over my own education, over my own life, over my own king. That's their faith. That's what Rahab's commended for. So she says, everybody's heard about you. Verse 12, she says, please swear to me by Yahweh that as if I've dealt kindly with you, you'll deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign. Remember, she lied to the king before she had any assurance that she would be spared. Verse 14, the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. That's hardly encouraging, right? She's like, promise me you'll look out for me. And the guys are like, yeah, we're with you. Even if we die, you'll die with us. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> we'll all die together. And they come up with the plan, the court out the window. Of course, you know the rest of the story. Absent faith, verse 14, would be bad news. Hey, we'll probably all die in this. But with faith, it makes sense. Like Moses, Rahab acted contrary to the law. I mean, think about that with Moses. Moses is escaping justice. Moses murdered a dude. The Pharaoh would have been well within his rights to put Moses to death. 
Here, the king is well within his rights to demand Rahab give up these people. But Moses defied the government. Rahab defied the government. Abram left his government. They all three decided to identify with God and God's people rather than their own nation, governments, power, or education. This is why James 2 verse 25 says, Was not Rahab the prostitute justified when she received the spies and sent them out another way? It's a very interesting expression in the Greek. Was she not justified when she did that? So in other words, the point that James is making is when she sent the spies out, was she not already justified at that point? That's the way faith and works go together here. At the point her works expressed themselves, was she not at that point already justified by her faith? Before she had any confidence in this thing working out, she was already justified by placing her faith in God and God and identifying with God's people over and against her own life and safety. That's Rahab. Fourthly, Daniel Daniel chapter 6. I mean, there's so many other people we could turn to, so many other examples of this, but there's so many examples from Daniel's life. I mean, you could preach several sermons just on Daniel expressing this kind of faith, but Daniel 6 is, of course, probably the most well-known. Daniel in the lion's den. It itself is a very interesting story. It pleased Darius to set up the kingdom 120 satraps throughout the whole kingdom, three high officials over them. Daniel was one of them. This is a very different approach to government than the Babylonians had. Allow me just one second to contrast the Babylonians and the Persians because it'll make this story make a lot more sense to you. The Babylonians, they prided themselves on assimilation. The Babylonians, they, they would conquer people and move them. The Babylonians had this idea, if you're Babylonian, you could live anywhere in the Babylonian Empire, it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to speak the Babylonian language. Everybody's going to worship the Babylonian gods. Everybody's going to have Babylonian names. They renamed everybody new Chaldean names. That was their, their language. They renamed everybody and forced assimilation and compliance. They'd conquer this city, move everybody over there, conquer that city, move everybody over here. That's the way the Babylonians, that's how they ruled. And Daniel climbs the ladder and goes to the very top of the Babylonian government. And then Babylon gets overthrown. The Persians come in, they do everything differently than the Babylonians. The Persians do not care about assimilation. The Persians prize diversity. They want multiple languages, great. Multiple religions, great. You can keep your, your old name. We don't care. We don't want to rename you. We don't want to re-educate you. Stay in your own city. We don't care. That was the Persian approach. Worship your own gods. Do whatever you want as long as you're ultimately loyal to our emperor. So the Persians, in that sense, had a better approach to government it looks like, I mean, they beat the Babylonians, they won, so it's not really subjective. They beat them. That was a better approach to government than the Babylonians had. And again, Daniel rises to the top. So two very different worldviews, two very different cultures, two very different political systems, and Daniel makes his way to the top of both of them. That's pretty insane. That's pretty insane. Some people get a demotion and just, like, lose their minds, and, like, my life is over, you know, I'm going to go work at Starbucks now or something like that, which I know Australians hate Starbucks, so you're like, there's nothing worse than working there in your minds, but it's because you don't know. I'm sorry. You don't know. <laughs> Daniel has climbed both ladders in both kingdoms and is at the top in both places. The Persian Empire, it's very delegated, 120 satraps, so every little province has its own leader. The provinces break into, like, the, you know, their government districts where, you know, like, 12 of these provinces approach to this guy, and, you know, 12 groups of 12, you can go to that guy. It's a very defined flow chart, and Daniel's over all of it. Verse 3, Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps. He's over the governors, he's over the senators, he's over the cabinet, because an excellent spirit was in him. The king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He's going to make him prime minister. The high officials, the satraps, sought to find a ground for complaining against Daniel with regards to the kingdom. But they could not find any ground or complaint or any fault because he was faithful. No error or no fault was found in him. That's amazing. You can find a fault with everybody. Right? Think of the people you work with. You can find a fault in every single one of them. Oh, man, that guy always shows up late to things. Oh, that guy always shows up early to things. Not Daniel. He shows up right on time. You can find a fault with that guy. Oh, that guy's, you know, that guy's ugly. Oh, that guy's too good looking. People tell me that all the time. 
not Daniel. Daniel's just right. He's Goldilocks. There's, they can't come up with any way to complain against him. He does everything so well, they try to invent an accusation, and they can't come up with one. And so look at the villainous plan of these other cabinet members. I and mean, politics is brutal. Here's the villainous plan in verse 5. These men said, we can't find any ground for complaining against Daniel unless we connect it to the law of his God. But the problem with the Persians is they let everybody worship whoever they want to worship. But they know Daniel. Like, if we're going to bring him down, it's got to be in relationship to God. So these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said, oh, King Darius, live forever. <laughs> All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors are agreed the king should establish an ordinance to enforce an injunction. You should be careful whenever something starts with all the experts agree. Right? Whenever something says every expert agrees with this, you know what you're about to hear is probably false. And that's what happens here. Oh, oh King Darius, all of the experts, all of the officials, all of the kingdom, all the prefects, all the university professors, all the people that have their PhDs, everybody who studied this, we're all together on this. The right thing to do. You should make an injunction. Notice even their language. They, they know that he wouldn't fall for like banning prayer. But an injunction, a temporary injunction. Whoever makes any petition to any god or man, because remember this is, you know, they're not persecuting a religion. Any god or any man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. <laughs> that got serious really fast. This is what they call in legal systems, and you might have the same kind of language here, a universally applicable law. So it's not persecuting one religion. It's saying any religion. Any religion. Uh, I was able to do ministry in Bhutan once. Bhutan is one of the only officially Buddhist nations in the world. It means king of, king, uh, Bhutan is kingdom of, of Buddha. And so Bhutan has religious freedom. You know that because if you check their Wikipedia page, it says Bhutan has religious freedom. However... Bhutan has a law against any religion that buries their dead. Not allowed. And so that's basically in, in Bhutan, which is Hindi and Bhutan uh, and, and Buddhist, which both cremate, and then Christians. So they say we have religious freedom. Be whatever religion you want to be, except if you're part of one of those religions that buries dead people, then no way. And so Christians there are severely persecuted. But you talk to government officials and they're like, oh, we don't persecute Christians. We only persecute people that are part of that religion that buries the dead. Not our fault it happens to only be the Christians in Bhutan. What do you want from us? That's this kind of law. They're saying we're not persecuting the Jews. This is a universally applicable rule. And we had kind of those in, in COVID in the United States anyway. The government would say, I don't know what Australia was like. Again, this is all American-based. The government say, would say, you know, we're, we're making a universally applicable law. You can't meet no religion that meets in Sundays to sing songs is allowed. Wait a minute. And they, most of the restrictions even call them churches. You can't meet in churches to sing songs. It's, it's, we're not persecuting any religion. It's just like a blanket rule. A blanket rule. You can be whatever religion you want, worship whatever you want, as long as it's not in a church and involving singing. That's the rule. Oh, also, baptisms, out. Baptism, no baptisms either. Holy kisses, right out. <laughs> and you start to think like, hey, wait a minute. I think it's only the Christians that do those things. <laughs> That's this kind of rule. Keep that in the back of your mind here. Oh, and they're not saying forever. They're not saying forever. They're just trying to provoke Daniel. It's, it's 30 days of no prayer. 30 days to slow the spread, they called it. Oh, come on. That's funnier than you guys are letting on. <laughs> 30 days to slow the spread of prayer. And so King Darius signed the document, of course, because everybody agreed. Now, I want you to think through real quick, what you would do if you were in this circumstance. You're in Babylon. The government signs a law that says no praying for 30 days. How would you do? How would you respond? Or better yet, imagine you're minding your own business in the suburb of Babylon, and you're sitting down for dinner, watching an AFL game on the TV or whatever, and you hear... And you go and you open your door, and there's Daniel, the prime minister. Daniel, is at your door? You're like, oh, come in. Let me get you some tea. Have a seat. What's going on, Daniel? Love you, man. Love you. Big fan. Voted for you every time. Love you. And Daniel says, I'm in, I got a problem. The king has passed a rule saying I can't be caught praying for 30 days. 
or he'll feed me the lions. What do you think I should do? I just want you to appreciate what the tension would be in your minds. Like Daniel is, he's important. You need a Daniel in the government right now. Without Daniel, you've just got like these wicked people running the government. Who knows what they're going to do? I mean, there is some pretty significant stuff on the horizon. Esther is in a few chapters after this. Esther's right around the corner. You see what the debauchery in the Persian Empire is going to produce. Esther, the whole story of Esther wouldn't have had to happen if you had a Daniel there to shut this whole thing down. Or Ezra. Remember Ezra's having to like sneak supplies for the temple in because people are going to steal from him? Because Ezra doesn't have a Daniel. I mean, there's serious things about to go down with Judaism here. They're going to try to kill all of the Jews in a few chapters because there's no Daniel. So picture the t- temptation to say, we just need you to... Daniel, okay, for 30 days, can you apply what Jesus said and pray in your closet so that nobody can see? I know Jesus hasn't said that yet. But do you see the temptation to tell Daniel, can't you just fly under the radar for 30 days? There's no rule that says you have to pray in public. There's no rule that says people have to see you praying. If anything, you could make an argument to the contrary. You should pray in quiet. These people shouldn't see you. You shouldn't be outed. You could get away with this, Daniel, and no Buddy would know. Just don't make waves, brother. We need you, Daniel. Well, when Daniel found out what happened, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and pray and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. So Daniel doesn't go to his closet. Daniel doesn't try to pray where nobody can see him. Daniel goes to the prime minister's house with a balcony that overlooks the plaza, throws open the windows, and prays facing the temple and to Yahweh. This is not, this is not just trying to fly under the radar here. You know, and Solomon did say, 1 Kings 8, when I have people who are in exile, if they pray facing this temple... Lord, will you hear their prayer and deliver them back from their exile? So there is biblical warrant if you didn't want to take 1 Kings 8 for facing the temple. That's kind of missing the point here. The point is that Daniel did not need to do this by any definition. I love looking at Daniel and how he defied government throughout his life. You know, his first temptation was when he was a teenager. Let's call him 20 years old. Let's, I'll do it in increments of 20 because it's easy to remember. Daniel was in 20, 20 years old, and he was told he had to eat the Babylonian food, remember? And he's like, okay, let's make, he, he negotiates. He calls the jailer in and he negotiates an amicable solution. You give me carrots and I'll get stronger and then we'll all be happy. He negotiates when he's 20. When he's 40, you've got the idol and he's got to worship the idol. And you remember what he and his friends did when they were 40 years old? They're like, you're going to burn, king. There's no more negotiation. It was like, you're going down in fire. Throw me in the fire. I don't care. I'll burn. You'll burn. We're all going to burn. You can't make me worship that. So there. I mean, it's full-on confrontation when he was 40. Right in the king's face. Even even ending with, like, maybe we'll die. Maybe we won't. I don't care. But I'm not going to worship the idol. So there. That's when he was 40. When he was 60, was the handwriting on the wall. He's called in for all the debauchery. And you remember what he does there? He just tells the king, you know what? I don't care at this point. You're going to lose. You're going to lose your kingdom tonight. And if you need me, I'll be in the other room. Like, it's just like by 60 years old, he's, he's done. Like, you know what? You deserve it. You're going to go down, king, and you just deserve it. I'm sorry for you. You get the, When you read that passage in Daniel, Daniel 5, you just get the impression, like, Daniel's just sorry for the guy. He's just so immoral. And he goes his own way. So he had negotiation, followed by confrontation, followed by pretty much ignoring and indifference. And now here he's 80 years old. Don't you get the impression that 80 years old, Daniel is, he's not getting in Darius' face. He's not just shrugging his shoulders. He's not negotiating. By 80 years old, he's thrown up in his window. What are they going to do to him? The guy's 80. You going to throw him in jail? You going to feed into the lions, the 80-year-old? Well, apparently they will find it really insightful thinking about how Daniel progressed through this. Daniel did not comply. Daniel chose to identify with Yahweh over and against his own government, 
over and against his own political power. So Abraham chose to identify with God over family. Moses chose to identify with God over wealth and privilege. Rahab chose to identify with God over government. Daniel chooses to identify with God over everything in the world. He'll lose it all. He has all that. It's all going to be gone. All going to be gone. Those are four pictures of faith. Now, if, you know, of course, they find out Daniel and feed him the lions, right? You know how the story goes. When Madison was born, I'm going to talk specifically to parents here. I see some parents here. When my oldest daughter was born, we're in the hospital, and Deidre's mom, my mother-in-law, comes and gives us a book in the hospital. I don't even remember what the book was called. It was some parenting book. It's the day Madison is being born. So Deidre's going in. She was induced, so we had the, you know, a few hours warning and in the hospital. And we get a book from mother-in-law. It's about parenting. And I'm just, you know, we're biding time in the hospital. And I open it, and I start flipping through it. And this book had such an interesting point. I don't even remember the name of the book, but it said, think of what kind of child you want to raise. And then do things intentionally to produce that kind of child. Okay? To me, it was like a radical parenting advice right there. It sounds so obvious. Like if you want a, a child that does this, then teach them to do those things and they'll do that. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And I use some examples. Like, do you want a child that is addicted to entertainment? Then put entertainment in front of them all the time. And guess what? They'll learn to be addicted to entertainment. So easy. You want a child that compromises, then you compromise in your own life in front of them, and they'll, they'll learn that, and they'll just go into it. And then it's said this, do you want a child who's going to be a missionary? Then, like, host missionaries in your home and pray for missionaries and give to missionaries, and they're always exposed to that, and one day they'll, they'll move into the mission field. Like, it's just kind of what happens. And I read that part to Deidre's mom. So, again, the day that my oldest is going to be born, her, you know, first grandchild from us. And I'm like, this is how it would get her to go in the mission field. And Donna's like, put that book away. Stop it. <laughs> my timing was all off. <laughs> you want a child who's going to be an evangelist? Then they'll watch evangelize in front of them. Teach them to evangelize. and just I mean, they grow into it. That's the point here. Now, that your, your scenarios might be a little bit different. But the big picture for my message this evening is more along the lines of this. Do you want a child, children, that identify with God and God's people over and against family, over and against wealth, over and against education, over and against the government, over and against their own life? Then give them examples of that in their own life. Do you want to raise a Rahab or not? Do you want your kids to grow up and value conformity to the culture or value conformity to God and God's people? I hope you see with all four of these examples I chose tonight, it was not easy choices. It cost these four people a lot. Did you notice that when all four of these stories ended, I ended at very particular points? None of them had happy endings. We left Abraham in a famine and Sarah off with Pharaoh. We left Moses in the wilderness as borderline homeless. We left Rahab with the walls about to come down and the soldiers on hot pursuit. And we left Daniel surrounded by lions in the lion's den. So that's where all four of them ended. And it's worth asking, did they make the right choice at that moment? And of course the answer is yes, because you know, you all know this, don't you? Like, well, what's the next chapter? The famine ends and Sarah comes back. What's the next chapter? God reaches out to Moses and brings him back for the, the ten plagues. What's the next chapter? Rahab gets her red cord and the walls come down and Rahab gets rescued. What's the next chapter? Daniel gets lifted out of the lion's den. The prime ministers get fed to the previously aforementioned lions. And Daniel gets a new vision from the Lord. So when you go to the next chapter, everything gets good. But you know what? That's, that really is how life is. And, and that's how Hebrews 11 keeps going on. Some of them, you know did receive back their dead. Some of them did have resurrections. Others of them were sawed into two. And so you need to like zoom out a little bit and go, well, what's the next chapter for Isaiah? He gets sawed into two. What's his next chapter? 
Well, the resurrection, of course. That's where Hebrews 11 ends. They're resurrected, and they receive what was promised to them when Christians join them, and we all receive it together. That's the point. So there's always a next chapter. There's always one more chapter. I hear people say all the time, if we're going to win back our country, and I think this is true in Australia too, if we're going to win back our country, we can't afford, you know, we need this politician to win and that politician to win in order for us to win back our country and guard our future, have a better place to raise our children. But that's just not true. That's building your home in the wrong place. Better to raise your children to not expect this world to be their home and then teach them to build cathedrals here. Lord, we're thankful for your grace and the promise that the resurrection makes faith worth it. There's no sacrifice for you that is not rewarded by you. I do pray for, I wish I had more time, but I do pray for grace. I pray that people in this congregation would show grace to each other, knowing that people will all make different decisions and they all make different sacrifices. Some people will choose to sacrifice here and not there, and others there and not here. And that's, that's just the freedom we have as Christians to raise our own kids uh, before you and to be accountable before you, but not accountable before each other. So I do pray that people would show grace to those in their church and those in their life as they all navigate difficult issues differently from one another because we do rejoice in Christian freedom. Um, we, we know that that requires your supernatural grace in our life. We don't take that for granted. So, we, Lord, would you pray for your grace? We pray for your love that binds our hearts together. We pray for courage, the courage to suffer for you, the courage to live life with integrity before you. So, Lord, we just beg you for that courage. We beg you for that grace. We beg you for that love that does bind our hearts in worship together. This is your church. We have unity. How sweet it is when brothers dwell together like dew running down the beard, like love that binds heart to heart. As Paul says in Ephesians, our hearts are knit together through common faith. So Lord, now we pray for the courage to live lives of boldness before you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.